James 5.16 in the New King James Version that says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Here it is, this is the part that I, I wanna preach off, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Holy Spirit, would you build us up today, equip us, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. How many people have prayed a prayer and the Lord has answered you? Pop your hand up. Great. The moment you became a believer, that was a prayer that was answered. So hopefully you've all got some prayers that have been answered. How many people on the other hand have prayed a prayer and you haven't got the answer? Yep, it's great. It's pretty much everyone for everything. I wanna, I wanna teach this morning um, and the message, the title of my message is The Effective Prayer Effect. The Effective Prayer Effect. You know, there are prayers and then there are effective prayers. So you can pray and we're all called to pray but how many people want to be effective in their prayer life? I don't wanna pray another unanswered prayer. I don't wanna waste my time sounding like a cool Christian with my big fancy words. I actually want to have effective prayer. Can somebody say amen? amen. So what I wanna do this morning is challenge you, whether you're in the room or online, that you can be a person who prays effectively. And, and, and it's not about the length of prayer. It's not about how you get your Pentecostal shambra rengede. It's about actually do your prayers get answered? Do your prayers get answered? Are your prayers effective? Because if we start praying effective prayers, it'll have an effect on our lives, our neighbourhoods, our communities, and even our nation. I, I wanna look at that particular verse there in the Greek. And actually what it's meant to be uh, aligned with is it's, it's meant to read this, much prevails the prayer of a righteous man being made effective. Much prevails the prayer of a righteous man who is being made effective. I wanna break down the words for you this morning and hopefully push some buttons and uh, leave you hopefully a little bit bigger. The word effective there is being made effective. So it's a journey of effectiveness. So you and I are on a journey. You don't just go from not being, being effective to being effective. We are being made more effective. So if there was like a percentage, you're on this journey where more and more of your prayers get answered and your effectiveness increases in the spiritual realm. The word fervent there, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man is actually never there in the original language. The, the translators of the New King James Version added the word fervent, I believe, because, uh, because of some kind of religious thinking where we think that we have to pray fervent prayers in order to be effective. So we put the onus back on us that if my prayers become fervent and my prayers become long and my prayers become full of passion, then all of a sudden I'll start to get an effective prayer life and nothing could be further from the truth. Effective doesn't mean long. Effective doesn't mean fervent. Effective means effective. Effective actually means I pray and God answers. I speak things into existence and they come to pass. I want to be effective in my prayer life. It says of a righteous man. So let's, let's figure out what a righteous man is. It's the, word, it's the word in the Greek, diakolos, which means a person who is right before God. It's not about your um, behaviour, although you should live a righteous and holy life before the Lord. What this verse is saying is if you have a right standing before the Lord, you've been made, how many know by the blood of Jesus, not by your own works, but by the blood, you have been made, you have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if you, if you disqualify yourself from effective prayer because you don't think you're a righteous man, you don't think you're a righteous woman, if you've given your life to Jesus and you've put your faith in the fact that He died on the cross and rose again and imparted his righteousness to you. Can I tell you that you are a righteous man? You are a righteous woman. Can somebody who's righteous say amen? amen? Okay, cool. So we've dealt with the righteous part. But what about the prevails much? A, a, a person who has these effective prayers that prevails much. It actually means your prayers are a potent force. Like when you pray, things happen. They're not just 
words that kind of hit the ceiling and do nothing. But when an effective Christian prays prayers, it is like a potent force that goes out into the atmosphere and the result is things change, both spiritually and physically. I wanna rock you a little bit this morning. Too much prayer without effectiveness will turn, turn you into an unbeliever. I wanna say that again for the people on the right. Too much prayer without effectiveness will actually turn you into an unbeliever. Because what happens is you pray and you pray, and if you're praying and you're not getting results, unbelief starts to enter into your heart, and now prayer has become your God, and the amount that you can pray, the length that you pray, the fervency that you pray, whether you pray in tongues or English or any other tongue, that becomes the goal instead of the person who answers prayer. And so the more I pray and I'm not effective, the more unbelief enters into my heart and I start to make silly excuses and doctrines that excuse why I'm not seeing the miraculous in my life. So my question to you today is this, who is more powerful, a person who prays three hours a day but doesn't see results or a person who prays three seconds a day and sees results? The answer is three seconds because results is what matters. Now, I'm not talking about your private devotional time with God. I'm not talking about secret place intimacy, that bridal love that we have with the Father. I'm, man, spend so much time in there. That's not a, t- a time limit thing. But what I wanna, I wanna stir you up and I believe the Lord is taking us on a journey to make us effective effective people. Jesus, when He came out of time with the Father, He didn't pray big fancy prayers. He prayed effective prayers. When He spoke, things changed. He went into a a, a funeral and and a child gets raised up from the dead. It wasn't a long prayer. It wasn't a everybody get the oil and put the oil on the, get the prayer cloth. Few words, bang, things started to happen. So we want to be effective. Too much prayer without effectiveness will turn you into an unbeliever. I see people all the time. Shabra-baba, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And they're going around in circles and nothing changes. I'm good for the wild stuff. I love it. I love wild worship. I love wild prayer meetings. Please don't hear my heart wrong. But if all of that is happening and nothing's changing, then your prayer is not effective. You can pray and spin on the ground and do all you want, but if you're not getting results, we need to change something. And I believe the Lord is calling us as a people, Freedom Center, to be effective in our prayer life. My question to you, and in fact, what it'll do is it'll make you a skeptic of people who are getting results. So that's why we have Christian ministries all over the world pointing the finger at people that are moving in power, signs and wonders, calling them demons and operating in witchcraft because they're the people that are not getting results. And then they think, well, how can you get the results? Are you praying from fear or are you praying from faith? Fear or faith? Someone once said to me just recently, uh, actually, it's someone else, that's not true, and then that person said to me that, hey, we've got to pray for, uh, is, you know, you've you got to make sure that you pray for your middle child uh, a lot more because the middle child gets, you know, left behind and there's countless stories of parents who didn't give their middle child enough prayer life and they've walked away from the Lord. That is rubbish. So now my prayers save my kids instead of the blood of Jesus. There's nothing in the Bible that says I have to pray. I'm, I'm not, I pray for my kids, don't hear me wrong. But there's nothing in the Bible that says I should pray, 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 big long prayers for my kids so that the Lord protects them. He already promised to protect them. He's their shield and their refuge. And the Bible already says that the blood of Jesus is all over my kids. They've all given their lives to Jesus. So I stand in faith that they are protected. Yeah, that they, are, that they are children of God. Now, I'm not telling you, don't pray, please pray. But what I am saying is if you think your amount of prayer for a certain person actually makes them what, what will keep them safe, we're wrong. The Bible says, train your child up in the way that they should go and they won't depart. They'll actually come back and they'll return. The instruction is to live a godly life in front of them. That's far more powerful than praying, 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 but living like a heathen. 
<laughs> Come on, someone. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, 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 I'm actually, I wanna, get, I wanna get to the depth of what you believe today. Because if you think that your length of prayer, amount of prayer, your, we, we, we've missed the point. It's by grace, it's by faith, it's by the blood of Jesus, the work has been completed. And maybe you're praying for your finances. Now, I'm not against you praying for your finances, but I do wanna challenge you to this. About 10 years ago, the Lord spoke to me out of Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Yeah, he actually before that says that don't worry about your clothes, your finances, all the basic stuff for the heathens worry about that. He compares a praying Christian to a heathen. A person who prays out of fear rather than out of faith like a heathen. He says, but you seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all this other stuff that everybody else worries about. Oh, where am I gonna move, God? I need a house, I need this, I need that. That's what heathens do. But if you're a son of God, if you're a daughter of God, all I need to do is seek first the kingdom. So the Lord said to me, don't ever pray for yourself again. I don't need to pray for myself. I need to seek the kingdom. He'll take care of all of that stuff. I've got way too many other things to pray about than to waste my prayers on me. Now, I'm not against you praying for you. Please don't take that. That's a Rima word for me. Adam, stop praying for yourself and seek the kingdom and all of these things will be added to you. So I've never had to pray for myself for the last 10 years and the Lord has blessed us tremendously. Why? Because we've seeked the kingdom and His righteousness. See, we know the Scripture, but do we live it? So we pray for things out of faith, like uh, out of fear sometimes. We, you hear it in people's prayer life. It's a fear thing. Father, please, would you protect my kids? Father, I pray that today no evil will beseech me. Lord, that this, and it's, and it's, and it's Prayer out of fear rather than prayer out of faith. Rather than getting up and saying, Father, thank you that my kids are covered under the blood. Thank you, Lord, that they are the head and not the tail and my finances will be good and I am above and not beneath. See, there's a difference between praying in fear and praying in faith. And everything in the kingdom of God, can I tell you, happens by faith. If you are un an unbeliever here today, and you haven't given your life to Jesus, the way that you become a son, the way that you become a daughter of God is by faith. The way that you get saved is by faith. The way that you get healed is by faith. The way that you get a breakthrough is by faith. The way that you see a miracle is by faith. Everything in the Kingdom of God happens through faith. Now let's not overcomplicate faith. Faith is a very simple thing, but what we've done is we've complicated it, we've made it this mystical hard thing that only a few faithful people can attain, but you've been given a measure of faith the moment you give your life to Jesus. You have enough faith on the inside of you. Everything is done by faith. I remember being back in the, uh, in the race course when we first started this church, and um, I, I, I remember we needed a keyboard player because we only had Ron on the guitar, and even before that, we didn't have Ron on the guitar, we had a CD player with a you know, the, the slides, the old slides? Literally, we had that. Now we got like one of the top worship teams in the, in the nation. And it's just like, but so everything happened by faith. We just put a keyboard up on the stage with no keyboard player. Hey, remember Ron? Just like, Lord, please bring a keyboard player. And then the keyboard player came. Every stage of this church and our lives has been by faith. We're going to Tupuki to plant a church. We've got no pastors for that location, faith. We're going, and the Lord said, believe for a thousand people to come to the crusade. How do I know a thousand people are gonna come? Faith. Faith, we go there by faith. Everything in the kingdom is by faith. I wonder this morning what area of blessing you are not able to access because you're operating out of fear instead of operating out of faith. You can't access anything without faith. So we want faith-filled, effective prayers, not long prayers. Now I'll give you a little bit of Bible just in case you think I'm a heresy. Matthew 6 verse seven says this, Jesus, our Saviour, your Saviour. When you pray, do not use vain repetitions. In other words, don't just keep saying things for the sake of saying them. Again, here He goes comparing us to the heathens like the heathens do, for they think, here it is, they think that they will be heard for their many words. 
So he's saying, as a son, as a daughter of God, you don't have to go into the place where you bash for getting an answer and actually grind it out. The heathens think that their many words will, will, will give them their miracle. They think that their many words will actually allow me to hear their prayers. But when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. Don't pray big, long prayers. Understand that I hear you the very first time you pray. Amen. You know, we need a building and I, like severely need a building as a church. But I can tell you that, that I don't, if you looked at my personal prayer life, it's not like I'm spending hours a day begging God, would you please give us a building? He's spoken, we've had prophetic words. So now I just declare the building is coming. Amen. The building's coming. Why do I need to waste hours and hours on end when Jesus never did that? <laughs> I'm coming, I'm not against long prayer, I'm against long prayers. Do you hear me this morning? Long, we, want, we don't want long prayers, we want effective prayer. Now the Bible says pray without ceasing. And someone yelled out at the 9 a.m., what about praying without ceasing? The word pray, praying without ceasing there is the word praying in worship. So it's a position of your heart. It's a worship thing. It's a constantly, I'm not talking about your relationship. I'm talking about when Jesus came out of the presence of the Lord and He came into the ministry with people. He did not pray long prayers. He prayed effective prayers. The effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. It makes things happen. My question to you today, how long did it take you to get saved? How long was the prayer? Let's say on average, five seconds. So the most important thing to you and the most important thing to the Lord, your soul and its salvation, the greatest miracle on the planet took you on average five seconds to get that miracle. You just declared it by faith. Why do we spend five years praying for a breakthrough? If the most important thing happens in five seconds, why don't we operate in that same place for the miracle, the breakthrough, wherever it is? See, once we understand prayer, we pray effective prayers, not long prayers. I love a, a beautiful lady in our church. Um, she's in her 80s and before the 9 a.m., this literally happened just before the 9 a.m., so in line with what I was preaching, she had no idea. She got healed from a, a brain cancer a couple of years ago when she first came to our church. And she came up to me and she said, Pastor, they've said it's not good. Um, I've got to go for another scan. There's all kinds of symptoms. I just want you to agree with me that it's gonna be all good. And I said, I agree, it's done. And she said, that's good enough for me and walked off. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Most people, you know what they'd want? Nere, give me the oil. Come on, prayer team, gather around. Shabra, ra, ba, 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 ba. And the person getting prayer feels very special, but nothing shifts. What did Jesus do? Be healed. Rise up and walk. You never see Jesus going, fellas, gather around me. Everybody stretch their hands out to the... <laughs> Can I get to what you really believe about prayer this morning? Are your prayers effective? Listen, if you're having effective prayers, then pray long because it'll be long, effective prayers. <laughs> but... I feel the tension, but it's good because I, 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 I want you to realise that the length or the fervency or the amount or the way that you pray is not what makes it done. It's faith in the God of miracles that we just... We say things like this, prayer warriors are prayer warriors because they spend a lot of time in prayer. Nothing could be further from the truth. The true measure of a prayer warrior is somebody who gets results. Amen. Don't confuse length with results. Don't confuse fervency with effectiveness. We are being called by God, Freedom Centre, into a place of effectiveness. Can somebody say amen? So what is a prayer warrior? What is a prayer warrior? We talk about prayer warriors all the time. And last week, my wife brought a spear in. So I thought I'd go one on her. Ah, uh, bring an ax in. Next week, AK-47. Week after that, C4. We're just gonna, we're just gonna come up. Week after that, Kim Jong-ul with some... 
<laughs> Did I say his name? Oh, I just said King Dong. Ooh. This is what the Bible says. A prayer warrior is an ax in the hand of the Lord. Let me explain it to you. Jeremiah 51, verse 20 to 24. You are my battle ax. This is God speaking to the prophet. You are, you, you are my battle ax. You are the weapon that I swing. You are my battle ax and weapons of war. For with you, I will break the nation in pieces. With you, I'll destroy kingdoms. With you, I'll break in pieces the horse and its rider. What are we talking about? Horses and if you study this, it's talking about high ranking principalities and powers. It's talking about those things will come down with you because you're not gonna pray fluffy prayers. You're my battle ax. When and with you, I will break in pieces the chariot and its rider. With you, I will break in pieces the young man and the maiden. With you, I will also break in pieces the shepherd and his flock. With you, I will break in pieces the farmer and his yoke of oxen. With you, I will break in pieces governors and rulers and repay Babylon and all the inhabitants of Chaldea for the evil that they've done in Zion. In your sight, says the Lord. Friend, you are a battle axe. Now you don't swing the battle axe. You allow the Lord to swing you and do what He needs to do. When Jesus came to the funeral and said, rise up, what did He do? He swung the ax. When He walks into a situation and the blind man gets healed and He prays a very simple prayer and someone's life is completely changed, it's a picture of a battle ax being swung. That's what God is calling us to. Every time you look at an ax, I want you to understand you are that ax and it's a representation of what prayer is meant to look like. I'm not, ta- again, I'm not talking about intimacy. I'm talking about ministry, pulling down, tearing up. Like, like I'm talking about God using you as a battle ax to actually make a difference in the nation. Actually make a difference in the nation. Here's the thing. The Word is sharper than any two-edged sword but an effective Christian is a battle ax. See, the Bible says that the Word is sharper than any two-edged sword. And a lot of us have thought that the Word is a two-edged sword. No, 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 it's sharper. He's using a, 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 a picture of something that's sharp and he's saying the Word of God is even sharper. It can't compare to a sword. It's sharper than a sword sharper than any two-edged sword. And then it goes on to say what it splits up. So a two-edged sword just splits up flesh. But but it says that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It it, it even divides soul and spirit. And the Bible even says it goes into the bones and the joints and the marrow and it can slice. That's why the Bible says, I sent my Word and it healed them because it can go into the marrow of, of your leukemia and it can take the cancer cells out of... I'm telling you, the, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says things like this, the Holy Spirit comes like a dove and we all think He's a dove. He's not a dove, He comes like a dove. Gentle like a dove. He's a person, but we, there's these characteristics. We've got, to read it, we've got to read our Bible properly. Sharper than any two-edged sword. So to be a prayer warrior is to be a battle axe. To be a prayer warrior is to be a battle axe. Tear down, destroy demonic things over your life, demonic things over your city, demonic things over your neighbourhood. You know what it needs? You don't, see, when you go to cut a tree, you don't bring a sword. If you need to cut a tree down and you saw council workers with a sword, you'd be like, what's going on here? What are they doing? This isn't ninja warriors. You need an axe. There are certain things that need a sword and there are other things that need an axe. Tear down, destroy, build up. There are some things that no matter how many times you pray, no matter how many times you quote the Word of God, no matter how long you pray in tongues, you can't take that thing down. If you need to cut a tree, you don't use a sword, you use an axe. An axe is only effective when it's sharp though. An axe is only effective when it's sharp. You ever used a blunt axe? This one's actually pretty sharp. Have you ever used a blunt axe? It does nothing. It just bruises the tree. You kind of become a hammer. 
So most of us, it, God's trying to swing us because we're meant to be a battle axe and actually we're just like a hammer. And we do some bruising, but we're not actually cutting down the tree. We're not actually making a difference. And so it's our job to keep us sharp. I'll give you some Bible for that. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10. If the axe is dull and no one, sorry, and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. This is a picture of a lot of us in prayer. We're praying, we're praying, we're going for it. We're, we're fasting, we're doing all the stuff. We're travailing in prayer and nothing happens. Why? Because we've become blunt axes. It says here, if you're, if you're blunt, if you're not sharp, you must use more strength. This is a picture of unsuccessful prayer, but I believe the Lord is calling us to effective prayer. Amen. Effective prayer. Sometimes we declare, we decree. I mean, I'm a pretty simple guy. I just ask the questions. If there's no effective prayer, then what's going on? We gotta ask the question, why? And Acts realises who it is that swings them. And Acts realises who it is that swings them. Isaiah 10 verse 15 says this. Uh, um, my wife asked me to share a story at the 11 a.m. that I didn't share at the 9 a.m. My, my daughter um, struggled with anxiety for quite some time. Um, and no matter how hard, how long we prayed, fasted, for some reason it just wasn't breaking. And it wasn't until I stood on the promises of God like an ax and said, she will be healed, she will be fine and just stood like an ax and went, no, she's gonna be good. Then it shifted. There are some things, there are just some things in your life, there are some things that you've been going after in your own strength, but my question is, are you sharp? Are you sharp? And if you are sharp, you'll see results. Now, we are not the ones that swing the ax, remember this. The Bible says that God swings us, we've just gotta remain sharp, yeah? So we gotta remain submissive, we've gotta remain sharp and allow the Lord to swing us so that we get results. Isaiah 10 verse 15 says this, shall the ax boast itself against he who chops with it? In other words, as battle axes, do we have anything to boast of? No, it's the Lord who swings us. He says, or shall the saw exalt itself against him who soars with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift it up, as if it were not only wood. Friend, just because we are a, a battle axe doesn't mean we've got anything to boast over. The only reason we can be effective in prayer and actually see results is because it's God that swings us. It's the Lord that swings us. So we declare and God does it. We declare and God does it. How's Moses? I like this. One of the best stories in the Bible. Moses is at the Red Sea. He's got Red Sea in front of him, Egyptians and death behind him. They're closing in, we know the story. And Moses does what any normal person would do. He goes to the Lord and he says, God, come, do a miracle. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. You've got to save us. You've got to split the sea. They're coming. Me and the people, we're all going to die. And I love God's response. God, you read your Bible. The, the, God looks at Moses and says, buddy, you do it. You're an ax. Put your rod in the ground. Read the Bible. That's what God says. He's like, why are you praying? And that's my question. I feel like some of you are praying for things you don't need to pray over anymore. Heresy, right? Stop praying. Now think about it. God said, why are you praying to me? Moses, why are you praying to me? Put your stake in the ground and watch the... You're an ax, friend. You're an ax. And maybe, just maybe, I, I know it's pretty simple, but if I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happens, then what's going on? Maybe we're going to God and God's saying, I've equipped you to do the very thing you're praying for. <laughs> but you pray and God sends you as the answer. I had a restorative moment. I can't go into detail because we're on a live stream. One of the greatest miracles I've ever experienced happened in my life this week. It... Oh, sorry, sweetie. It's, it's, it's upsetting you? Okay. All right, cool. So... That's all right, we'll put it over there. So if, you're, if you are 
a, uh, what, where was I up to? I've gone blank. Oh yeah, so I had a great miracle this week and I can't share it because it's live stream, but basically I had a restoration of a relationship uh, in my life, in my immediate family, and it was because we stopped, we declared, and we said, God, do a miracle. And bang, it opened up. And it was, the, it, was, it was the greatest thing that's happened to me bar having kids, bar getting married, bar marrying my beautiful wife. It was the greatest miracle I've ever experienced. And it's because I realized, man, I'm an ax. Let's go for it. Yeah? Moses at the Red Sea. Don't you love God? Stop praying, buddy. You do it. Stop praying, buddy. You do it. But then later on in Exodus, it actually says that by the nostrils of God did the Red Sea open. So God needs us to actually initiate and make the first move and then heaven always responds. Here's the thing. The Bible says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Let's think about this verse for a second. Whatever who you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. The word bound there uh, means to forbid, not to allow, to deny. So whatever I bind on earth, heaven responds. Whatever we loose on earth or allow on earth, heaven responds. And a lot of us are praying for heaven to respond first when God's given us the authority to bind and loose over our situations. And so I wonder what areas of our life we've got to stop praying and we've got to start swinging the ax. I pray heaven responds. What angels are waiting to take orders from you and they're like bored out of their brain because you're praying instead of declaring. You're praying instead of making an effective prophetic declaration over your life. I'll give you some more Bible, 2 Kings 7, verse one to two. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Just for some context, Elisha uh, and the children of Israel are in a place in this moment where they're under siege and they're in famine. What's happening in that particular moment, it got so bad that the Bible says that there was no food around, (coughs) so much so that the economy started to shift in such a way that even uh, the Bible says dove dung, like dove poo was being sold for, a, for quite a substantial amount of money because there was no flour, there was no food. So they started to eat things they shouldn't have and things that shouldn't have had value started to have value. And Elisha comes and he says, thus says the Lord tomorrow. And funny enough, he says, thus says the Lord, but we don't get any insight of God telling him to say it. He stands in his mantle as a prophet and he makes a declaration that God backs up. Tomorrow about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be, sold, shall be sold for a shekel. It's almost like a tongue twister. And two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So what he's saying, tomorrow things are gonna shift. He's not saying, hey, the economic forecast is looking pretty glim and I think is about an eight year turnaround and uh, the real estate market's gonna, no, no, he's like, tomorrow everything's gonna change. Everything's gonna change. And he says, fine flour shall be sold for this much. Barley shall be sold for this much. And so an officer whose hand the king leaned on answered the man of God and said this, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And then he makes this prophetic declaration that comes true. He says, he says, uh, in fact, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And the man that he speaks that to dies the next day. The prophet makes a declaration and the Lord backs him up. I believe the Lord is, is, is raising us up to this kind of prayer life. It's not arrogance, friend. It's knowing who you are in Christ. That you come out of a place of intimacy with the Father. He shows you what He is doing. And then you come out and you don't pray long-winded, beautifully spiritual, it sounds good prayers, but you come as an ax and you make things happen. And heaven responds. Heaven responds. You shall see it with your own eyes. Elisha speaks about this and the Lord, what did he do? He laid the ax. He laid the ax. Then the, uh, later on in the, in, the, um, in the Scripture, it says that there were lepers there and they said, if we go here, we'll die. If we go there, we'll die because they're under siege. And the Lord causes them to hear a war that was going on, but there was no war going on. It was just the sound of the ax being laid. So again, intimacy is long. Intimacy should be time with the Father, but prayer is quick. Elijah 
says to Jezebel, in a few moments, however long it was, I'm paraphrasing here, you're gonna die and the dogs will lick your wounds in a certain valley. Guess what happens? Exactly what the prophet says. Now, as New Testament believers, we're all called to prophesy. We're all called to be people who declare the Word of the Lord. I'm trying to get deep into what you think. Maybe you're praying too much for things and you need to start realising you're an axe and chop that thing that's standing in the way of your miracle. Intimacy is long, prayer is quick. So then the question becomes, how do I become effective? I'm glad you asked. Because that's what we're all here for, right? Adam, you took 20 minutes to get to what I really want to hear. How do... I become effective. There's a couple of factors at play here. And the first one is faith. And I'm sorry to simplify it. I'm sorry to dull it down because we all want the big formula, right? But the formula is faith. Jesus said this. He said, Mark 9, 23, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now I know we read it, but we skim through it. And the question is, do we believe it? To him who believes, The problem is we've got too many unbelieving believers and we need to be believing believers. It's the nature of who we are. We are people of faith. We are people who believe for the miraculous. We are people who believe for the impossible. And so he says, if you can believe, and that's the big question, if you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Some things only happen for believing believers, aggressive believers. The problem is we struggle with unbelief. And I'm glad you're in the same boat. We're in the same boat. There's people in the Bible that are in the same boat. So I wanna wanna land this plane and I wanna help you and give you an actual tool to become effective so that when you pray, things actually happen. If we can get the band up. There is only one instance in the Bible that I know of that we see the disciples praying for somebody, not getting the answer to the prayer that they prayed and then having a conversation after it with Jesus about why it didn't happen, which is a fair question, right? So this is gonna help you. I believe this is the moment that if you can catch this, not just here, but in your heart, I believe it'll help a lot of people. So it says this in Matthew 17, verse 14 to 21. When they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and he suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Effective prayer. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. I love this story. This this scripture, when it was revealed to me by revelation, it actually genuinely changed my life. It changed my prayer life. It changed my effectiveness. It changed my outlook on how I view unanswered prayer. So let's go through it for a second. And I believe some people are gonna be set free from some thinking that's not biblical, and then we're gonna release us to pray for one another and we're gonna see God do some miracles here this morning. So we have this moment where there's a dad who's worried and and very upset as most parents, if you've got a a sick kid, if you've got a kid with a disease or a sickness, you know the turmoil that this dad must have been going through, right? Like his son has epilepsy, but it's not only epilepsy, it's epilepsy that throws him into the fire and into the water. So he gets burnt, he drowns, there's all kinds of things going on. And so we see this, this, this worried dad. 
And to give you some context, Jesus is up on the Mount of Transfiguration at that time. He's actually there and he's, 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 he's pray. He has this incredible encounter with Moses and Elijah. We know the story, the glory of the Lord falls on the place and they're having this wonderful time. All the while when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration, His disciples are at the bottom of the mountain and this dad comes to the disciples. My son, my son, the disciples are here, let's go. Takes them to the disciples. You're His followers, right? You're the ones that are meant to do the stuff that He does, right? And so the disciples are like, yep, let's pray. And they pray like most of us pray. They, they must have done everything. Man, they're shambra, renge, they're putting handkerchiefs on, her, on Him. They're, they're praying in tongues, they're putting oil, they got prayer cloths. Man, they're doing everything they know how to do. They're praying for hours while Jesus is having a mighty fine time up there with the Father at the Mount of Transfiguration. And so the Father's frustrated, right? Because the boy, he's not cured. It's unanswered prayer. But the disciples have been told by Jesus, we can do the same things as you. Well, how come when we pray for this kid, he's not healed? And so Jesus comes down off the mountain. I love Jesus. He comes down off the mountain, cool, calm and collected, just had a mighty time with his, some of His boys. And He's like, what's going on here? What's happening? What's all this kerfuffle about? Kerfuffle, that's a biblical word. Kerfuffle. And they're like, Master, we've been here praying for three hours. We're doing everything, man. You like, we've got people waving flags. We're like, we're praying. We're praying with faith. We're, 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 we're joining hands. We've done the agreement thing. We've done everything you know how to, like, everything we know, everything you've taught us. And this is not moving. And you know what Jesus says? He's like, Oh, faithless and perverse generation. The word there means you've got no faith and you've got twisted thinking. You're not thinking like heaven, you're thinking like earth. That's what the original Greek actually means. Your thinking is wrong about this situation. Bring the boy to me. He's like, oh, you're twist, you're, your thinking's all wrong. Bring him here. I love Jesus. Just bring him here. I'll sort this out. How long shall I be with you? In other words, I'm about to go to the Father. Fellas, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'm about to leave. If you don't get this right, this hint, the whole world hinges on you knowing how to operate in the supernatural. Bring Him here to me. How long shall I bear with you? Now He's like bearing with them, right? I'm just sick of bearing with you guys. Bring Him here to me. And I love this, His effective prayer, right? And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of Him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples go to Jesus privately and they ask Him a question that I think is pretty valid. Why could we? Do you notice they never blamed God? Because that's what most Christians do. Most Christians in this situation go, God, why haven't You healed me? But the disciples ask the right question. Why could we not cast it out? We don't like that because we want to pray and leave it to God. But they come and they say, why could we not cast it out? And I love Jesus' answer. And it's very different from the answer that a lot of theologians tell us. Jesus' answer is this, because of your unbelief, full stop. Because of your unbelief, full stop. For assuredly I say to you, He's addressing the faith issue because People are thinking, I need more faith. Assuredly, I say to you, if you've got faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to the mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible. In other words, faith ain't your problem. Unbelief is your problem. Here He goes, here He goes. Here's the revelation. However, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. And you and I have sat in countless sermons and teachings where people have told us that this kind of demon only comes out by prayer and fasting and nothing could be further from the truth. It's not like I could pray for a demon after church today and then he's like, oh, I saw you eat breakfast this morning, I'm not coming out. I saw those wheat bigs. I saw those oats and peanut butter and blueberries and I ain't coming out. Do you see when we think stupid when we read the Bible in a funny way? 
What was Jesus' answer to their question? Because of your unbelief. However, this kind, this kind of what? Not demon, this kind of unbelief only comes out by prayer and fasting. Friends, this will change your prayer life because you come out and you pray and if we're not seeing the results that we want, we come up with all kinds of excuses like, well, it might not be God's timing. Maybe it's just not the timing of the Lord, brother. Or we say things like, maybe it's not God's will to heal you, sister. Not in the Bible. Not Bible. Just makes us feel good though. But I wanna equip you today to become more effective. If you've been or you are in the situation of the disciples, try not to see it through your experience, but see it through the Word of God. And the Word of God says, because of my unbelief, listen friends, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm walking this journey. I've prayed for nine dead bodies to come back to life in my time walking with the Lord. I haven't seen one rise up yet, but I will continue to pray. I will continue to believe. And every dead body that God puts in front of me, I'm gonna pray and we're gonna see it become a normal part of Christianity, I promise you that. Now why, 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 why? See, I look at this and I go, right, I've got some unbelief. Let me explain to you what unbelief is. If I bring a woman up here and she's got a massive cancer coming out of the side of her neck and I'm like, church, can God heal this woman? Everyone would be like, hey! Can He do it now? Oh. But if I grab Ruel and I say, church, Ruel's got a headache. Can God heal him? Yay! Can He do it now? Yeah! We all believe it. Why? You can't see the headache. But the, the tumour hanging out of the lady's neck, I can see that thing and immediately unbelief enters into my eyes. Unbelief enters into my heart and I operate out of fear and unbelief instead of faith. Jesus said to a person, what's easier for me to say? Take up your bed and walk or your sins are forgiven. And everyone said, of course, it's your sins are forgiven. Why? Because I see the paralytic and he's not walking. And it's very hard for me to believe that he could just take his bed up and walk. But if you say sins are forgiven, no one has a problem when we have an altar call and five people give their lives to Jesus. If I asked every believer in the room, are their sins forgiven? You'd be like, yeah, of course they are. They made a, they made a faith declaration. But if we said, are they healed of A, B and C? You'd be like, ah. Oh. Why could we not cast it out? Because of your unbelief. Do you know what I love about this? Is I can grow. I can get rid of my unbelief. Jesus has given me a tool. It's called prayer and fasting and it kills unbelief in my life. It kills unbelief in my life. What area of your life are you swinging that axe? What area of your life are you, and you're not sick and you're going, God, why haven't I seen the answer? Friend, if you can be bold enough to accept sometimes, I'm not saying you've got to go to the Lord and if He says it's because of my unbelief, I don't take that as discouraging, I take that as very encouraging. Okay, I'm growing in this thing. I've prayed for people and cancer has been healed in their body. I've also prayed for people, my own sister, and she died at 23 years old. But I will not stand for the notion that my experience dictates what the Word of God says. The Word says by His stripes we are healed. So I pray and I fast and I get rid of the unbelief that's, that lays within me and we move into a place and we go from glory to glory, strength to strength until we walk in the normal lifestyle of Jesus. The normal lifestyle of Jesus. Friend, you can raise the dead. You can heal the sick. You can move in signs, wonders and miracles. But it takes it takes an understanding. I am a battle axe in the hand of the Lord. And if I've got unbelief, prayer and fasting is my tool. Prayer and fasting does not get some demons out that are super strong. The Name of Jesus above every other name. Why do we think some demons have more power? A beautiful sister, we heard a te testimony just the other week of death over her life and over her family. And you know, so many people have prayed. It's not the, it's not the thing you wanna hear before you pray for someone for deliverance. Oh, there's plenty of men and women of God who have prayed and nothing's happened. Lord, 
I felt the Lord say, look at her and just say, come out. Look at me, come out in Jesus' Name. It's not because I spent four hours in the morning in prayer. I just understand that I'm an ax. Lord, swing me. Faith, simple, simple faith. Your length of prayer, your fervency in prayer, your ability to quote Scripture, your ability to pace up and down and pray in tongues, it's all good, but don't think that that earns you some kind of spiritual manner where God can now use you. No, you are a son, you are a daughter. It's the way you think. Get rid of the unbelief and start swinging. Start swinging. Why don't we stand to our feet? Come Holy Ghost. This kind of unbelief only comes out by prayer and fasting. No one's gonna eat dinner tonight. Okay, we're gonna pray for each other. I'd love you to just get in groups of three or four and just ask the people around you, what miracle do you need? And I'm only gonna give you like 30 seconds because I need you to understand short, sharp, effective prayers is what does the damage. Not our length of prayer, not our ability to pray, but our ability to know who we are, swing the ax, church. And then next week when you come back, I want you to get a Connect card and we wanna see the testimonies of all that God has done. Come on, like let's not just pray and forget about it. Let's see, are the prayers being answered? That's the goal of prayer, right? Answered prayers, miracles actually happening. And then we're gonna sing the first song that we sung. We're gonna praise Him. We're gonna thank Him. Church, we're gonna step into this place of faith. And I want you to imagine yourself as the ax that God is swinging this morning. Sharp, sharp. Come on, go in groups of three or four. Let's pray, let's pray.